Hello, beautiful people. Welcome to Nectar, Sex, and Soul. I'm your host, Soraya Leonora, and I'm a holistic sex and relationship coach. This is a chance for us to get intimate, to reach far into the mystical, magical, erotic, tender, inspiring, vital, primordial depths of what it is to be human, what it is to express and inhabit these amazing bodies fully, and what it is to make love to the divine in everything we do. We'll be penetrating deeply into the nectar of what it is to be alive and turned on by life, how to transmute pain and hardship into pleasure and medicine, how to embody the union of polarities, including sex and spirit, and how to love every piece of ourselves wholeheartedly. This is a space where we don't just talk about the act of sex, but rather how sexual energy permeates every area of our lives as the seed of creation and the source from which we all came. Exploring sexuality in this way not only takes our sex lives to the next level, but is a catalyst for a life that turns us on in each and every moment, not just in the bedroom. Within you stirs a sexual vitality that is capable of so much more than you could possibly imagine. This is what we explore on Nectar, Sex, and Soul. Thanks for coming to play. Hello, everyone. I just want to pop in here and say before we start the episode that I really encourage both men and women to listen to this episode in its entirety. There is so much gold here that is so important for everyone to hear. And we have some really special gifts for you at the end. So please do stay all the way through. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Nectar, Sex, and Soul. This is Saraya Leonora. I'm so happy to have you all here today. And today we're going to be getting into a topic that is it's super important and relevant today. And I have a really special guest who I will be sharing with us all in just a moment here. But we're going to be diving into some of the concepts connected to the overturn of Roe versus Wade that feel incredibly important to address right now. And my guest and I have wanted to discuss this topic for five years. We've been uh, kind of scheming on this for a very long time and it feels really pressing and like we have to do it now. So I'm excited we're finally doing it. But basically today we're gonna be talking about procreative sovereignty and the way that we can do that as a team. Um, It takes two to tango. And so the idea that birth control, birth prevention, uh, or pregnancy prevention, rather, that these have been like a women's issue, that abortion has been a women's issue. These are not just women's issues. These are also very necessary for men to be involved in. This is a human issue. And I am a huge believer that our bodies are designed to be at choice as to if and when we create life. Conceiving is not just this thing that happens on accident. Like it happens so frequently that you would think it is, but actually it's it's not super easy to just get pregnant on accident. If you're paying attention to your body, if you are in communication with your lover, if you understand how your body works and you're working with various different methods, we absolutely do have the power to be at choice as to when, if we conceive. And so this is information that I think is super empowering, super essential for everyone to be aware of. So we can start decreasing our dependence on thinking that we need external technologies in order to prevent this. Um, You know, I'm absolutely a believer that every woman has the right to a safe abortion. And I also believe that we need to stop leaving that entirely in the hands of our government and giving our power away in that way. So, you know, birth prevention, uh, pregnancy prevention has been highly corporatized. Um, Everything related to women's bodies has been highly corporatized. We've been massively disconnected from this ancient innate wisdom that women have been working with since the beginning of humanity. And it's so important that we look at now as an opportunity to reclaim our procreative sovereignty in a way that we never have before in our modern era. And to do that in unison as a team, men and women working together on this issue to reclaim our power and 
you know, really the government should not be the one making this decision. Like we have sovereignty over our bodies in a way that they cannot actually take away from us. If we know how our bodies work, we hold the power within to be at choice regardless of what they say or do. So it's my intention with this episode to help everyone come home to that awareness. Uh, This is a really stressful time for a lot of people. This is a horrible injustice and It's very important that we start offering pragmatic solutions to cut through the panic and to start moving the needle forward. So one of the reasons that I'm so passionate about sharing this information is that after being on birth control for seven years and having it wreak havoc on my body, I have successfully used the methods that we're going to be talking about in this podcast today. Uh, No other contraceptives have just worked with the wisdom of my body and learning my body being in communication with my partner and my partner learning seminal retention to have no unplanned pregnancies for over a decade now. So just speaking from my own personal experience and really excited to share that with all of you. And, um, you know, spread this information to the communities who need it the most, spread it far and wide, and especially to those who are least likely to find this information and who might be marginalized and particularly needing access to safe preventative care and abortion and things like this. So before I introduce our guest, I'm going to make a disclaimer really quick that we are not doctors. This is not medical advice. We cannot be held liable for any outcomes um, as, as it pertains to what you choose to do with this information. So please use this at your own risk. Do your own research. Trust your own intuition. Listen to your body work with practitioners and um, recognize that this is this is information that we are offering from our own areas of study, from our own anecdotal evidence, our own experiences, and that of other people that we know. Uh, but please use at your own risk and do not uh, take this as medical advice. All right, so without further ado, I am super excited to introduce a very dear sister of mine. We've been friends for a long time, I'd say at least a decade, and we've been talking about teaming up to discuss the topic of helping people come together to tackle the issue of pregnancy prevention as a team instead of that just being something that's put on women. So I am really excited to introduce Elsa Earl. She is an astrologer, an energy worker, and a women's reproductive advocate. She is a very multi-talented woman who has steeped herself in all kinds of esoteric studies and weaves them together in a really powerful way and has been a huge Uh, a huge person of of different types of guidance in my life. I love going to her for astrological insights amongst other things. And I really love the way that she ties that awareness into the topics that we're going to be discussing today, which is a point of connection I think a lot of people would not make on their own. So I'm really excited to kind of unpack that. And Elsa, welcome. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. It's a, an honor, honestly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there anything that you want to share with us before we dive into the conversation about who you are, what you do, what you're passionate about, anything you'd like us to know? Um, I just want everyone to know that this topic is really dear to my heart because it's kind of one of the... Um, it really touches on one of the most difficult pieces of lead I was handed in my life that I had to alchemize into gold to learn the wisdom from. And that was my own unplanned pregnancy and my own journey with uh, fertility care and birth control. And it's been, you know, a wild ride at times. And I feel like I've come out the other side with knowledge to share. Beautiful. Thank you. And I'm, I'm excited to hear more of that journey throughout the course of this conversation. And I'm really grateful to you for being willing to share your personal journey and sharing of, you know, sharing, sharing the the gold that you've alchemized uh, from, from this chapter of your life and the way that you've shared this with other people and the work that you do. It's, it's really powerful when it comes from somebody who has walked that path and who is speaking from their own experience. So 
I'm really excited to have your very unique expertise and personal experience uh, so generously shared with our audience. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It's very appropriately timed uh, that the nodal axis is back in Taurus and Scorpio because fertility is going to be a big issue um, as we have seen with the news recently. And I remember back to 2013, 2014, and then 2003, 2004. And there were points in time then where most women I knew were dealing with some sort of fertility issue. So here we are again. Mm, so you're speaking to clarify for people who don't know a lot about astrology, the nodal axis that we are on as a collective is particularly affecting the collective as it pertains to fertility. Yeah, absolutely. Because Scorpio rules birth and death and Taurus is connected to fertility. So those two signs, particularly um, since we'll have eclipses for a few years in those signs, it's going to bring up issues of unplanned pregnancy, of trying to be pregnant, of fertility issues, and obviously rights and access to awesome or even just basic um, reproductive care. Wow. So then our timing is is perfectly aligned. I mean, we've been, we've been talking about offering discussions on this since 2017 and we're, we're just now doing it. So it feels like really perfect timing. It is. And uh, for anyone that might not be a believer in astrology, I do want to say you really can go back and look at historical events and how they line up with the astrology that was happening. Um, it's very much an as above, so below, as within, so without situation. And I, I can speak from personal experience that it has been a very real force in my life. So even if you are not particularly into astrology, do keep an open mind. And I want to say this episode is really important for men to listen to as well. Please, if you are a man that loves women, that cares about the health and well-being and happiness of women that wants to do your part that wants to take responsibility for what is actually yours to take responsibility for because you are half of the equation please listen to this episode even if you are past your child bearing years even if you've had a vasectomy like whatever it is um please please listen to this because this is important information that needs to make its way around the world and you're, you're doing a great service by educating yourself on this topic. <clears throat> okay. So I'm really seeing everything that's happening right now as a huge opportunity to take our power back into our own hands and to return to the ancient ways that our bodies are, are literally designed for. Like the human design is an incredibly intelligent design. We are not just without the capability to choose when and if we procreate. Like that's that's honestly ridiculous. Like there, it's 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 like built into our system to have this awareness, to have this communication with our bodies. And the the more deeply we understand this from different angles, the more confident we can be in navigating our own procreative sovereignty. So I want to say that, first of all, like the overarching topic of this is that I think it's really important to understand each person plays a role, right? It takes two people to create life. And honestly, men, you should care even more. Like, just because you're the one that doesn't have to carry the baby doesn't mean you're like dismissed from responsibility. Like, <laughs> this, is, this is like the kind of thing that everyone needs to be taking taking equally as seriously. And I cannot express the amount of times that a man that I've been in connection with in my younger days, or like men that I've talked to or worked with, they don't even take the time to check in with somebody that they're hooking up with about if they're on birth control, what the backup plan is, if they, if they get pregnant, like, yeah, what is the game plan? Like, how are we going to share in sexual pleasure without creating a life if that's not what we want to do. So these are conversations that need to be had. And it's really important to have a preventative plan as well as a backup plan if something slips through the crack. And it's very important for each person to be taking responsibility. So what this looks like is for women, learning things like fertility awareness method, being able to track your cycle and listen to your body 
And then learning about lunar ovulation, which is something else is going to be talking about today. That is a very little known, little understood topic that's very important to understand because it's a piece that can throw fertility awareness method off and make it not as accurate as it could be. Um, so for, for women, being able to work with these two things, as well as knowing your herbal allies, knowing which herbs can support you uh, preventatively, and also in the, in the case of an emergency of, of needing to abort a pregnancy. So we're going to be focusing on herbal allies, as well as lunar ovulation, and then seminal retention on the part of men. So for men, you have the capacity to separate orgasm from ejaculation, and you have the capacity to withhold your seed and to experience enormous amounts of pleasure and have a whole different type of full body non-ejaculatory orgasm without spilling your seed and risking getting your woman pregnant. So we're gonna get to that piece later. For now, we're gonna start diving into Elsa's area of expertise. And we're not gonna speak a ton on fertility awareness method in this episode. I might do another episode on it at some point, but there are a ton of resources on that. Um, and basically what it is, is a way of charting and tracking your cycle through learning to listen to the rhythms of your body, learning to read your cervical mucus, tracking your temperature, and just being, being aware of other symptoms, other ways that your body communicates based upon where it is in its cycle. So, um, you know, it's, it's a way of being in tune with your body. It's not 100% foolproof on its own. And I'll say that neither is any other form of birth control out there, um, but we're going to be talking about ways that you can stack different approaches for maximum efficacy. And yeah, Elsa, um, I'm going to pass it off to you to start sharing with us about lunar ovulation. What is this and why does nobody know about it and why is it important? Okay. Thank you. So, um, lunar ovulation was actually discovered in 1959 by a gynecologist who was a, an astrologer. He was attempting to help women who were Catholic, uh, to have better success rates with, uh, family planning or rhythm method because they were noticing that they were failing and they couldn't explain why there's a number of women who experience unexplained pregnancies and what he did was he was tracking the charts, the astrological charts of the women. And he noticed that women were actually, according to his work, um, more likely to conceive a child during the phase of the moon that they were born under, meaning the phase like new moon, um, waning crescent, quarter moon, full moon, and so on and so forth. Um, so he discovered this link and he set up a fertility clinic and um, it is told that he had greater success rates. And so I found this out when I got pregnant on the second day of my period. And I was like, how could this have happened? How could this possibly have happened? I was smart enough to be tracking things. And I was using an app at that time on my first edition iPad, cause it was 2013. And I was tracking the dates that I had sex. And uh, my partner was also going, he had gone away for a while. And then I he realized I was pregnant. And I was like, how could this have happened? We were so careful during um, the times that I was in my ovulation window to use condoms. And um, we only had unprotected sex around my period. So there was, it was boiled down to, I actually got pregnant at a time that I really thought that was not possible from everything that I had educated myself about, um, the menstrual cycle. And a friend of mine came forward and sent me an article about lunar ovulation, which I had never heard of, but I've been an astrologer for 20 years and was deeply immersed in understanding the cycles and rhythms of the planets and how they affect us as humans. So this made a lot of sense to me. And I went back and checked the charts, my astrology charts for when I got pregnant. And sure enough, I was experiencing um, the same phase of the moon that I was born under. 
So for me, I was born two days before the new moon and I got pregnant two days before the new moon. And I thought there was no way that that was possible until I was introduced to this information. Wow. Wow. That is wild. And you're definitely not the only person that I've met who got pregnant during their period. And um, so, you know, I've, I've certainly seen this happen multiple times with women who were tracking their cycles and who got pregnant during their period. So have I, because this, when I got pregnant, it was 2013 and I've had a lot of clients and girlfriends who've experienced unplanned pregnancies. And I, whenever I've given the opportunity to be in on that sort of intimate information, I was asked if they were tracking when they had sex and I, if they know for sure, or likely when they got pregnant. And I've seen it happen over and over where um, other women also got pregnant during the same phase of the moon that they were born under. Wow, that is wild. And, you know, we live in a society that would dismiss this type of thing um, as woo-woo, as crap, just because it's, a to it's associated with astrology. So I'm not surprised that there aren't any scientific studies that actually have um, attempted to study this in a clinical way using scientific methods. So you won't find anything that proves it. You will find people postulating that it's, that it's not true, but I've seen enough anecdotal evidence and I haven't seen anyone design a scientific study that actually would prove beyond reasonable doubt that there's truth to this. So, I mean, some people may want to dismiss this right away, but I think, you know, if it speaks to you, you may want to begin looking at the phase of the moon that you're born under and tracking that and considering it when you're having sex and how you treat, um, you know, your safety precaution or your plan of action during that time. And so looking at it as a second fertility window and treating it in the same way that you would when you're ovulating. Exactly. Uh-huh. And you, would you say treating it as another five day window? Because for, so, so typically we take the five days leading up to ovulation, um, knowing that sperm can live in the system for that period of time. Some people might even try to add more of a buffer zone if their cycle was not perfectly regular. Um, with the lunar ovulation, do you look at it as like a three-day fertility window, a five-day? Like how do you typically go about that? So that's a little bit subjective. Um, when I was using it for my own knowledge, I would be careful for about 72 hours beginning like one day before uh, my the date of my lunar ovulation. But I've read some people stick with five days. Some people say that they theorize that you're only, um, only you have like a fertility window where the egg is only viable for 24 to 48 hours. So I've seen people use shorter windows. I kind of fall somewhere in the three to four days of being careful. And I think, um, you know, each woman can sort of make that decision for herself. Sure. Yeah, and I think that's that's a very important thing with a lot of these things we're talking about. It's trial and error and getting to know your body really well and having backup options and other um, preventatives that you are layering with this. But it's like, you know, even if this idea sounds silly to you, why would you not want to throw it on top of your fertility awareness method if you're concerned, if you want an extra safety precaution and, you know, see see how it works for you because... We, we know several people, most of the people who have gotten pregnant during their period, which is not supposed to be able to happen, um, according to, you know, the fact that we become pregnant when we ovulate. So it's definitely worth exploring. And again, even though it sounds woo-woo, there is absolutely all kinds of scientific uh, correlations that we could draw here because of how the moon affects our bodies, how it affects the tides and how it affects other things on the earth. Um, before we had artificial lighting and all of our technologies, women bled with the new moon and with one another. You know, this, this was the way that our, the rhythms of our bodies worked. And that has gotten thrown off through all kinds of different things, artificial lighting, hormonal imbalances, I mean, the list goes on. But women's bodies have always been very deeply tied 
to the lunar cycle. And Elsa, I know you have some other really interesting things to speak to in terms of how the cycles of the moon affect other uh, facets of life on the planet that I think would be really helpful to speak to to kind of contextualize why something like the lunar phase could affect being for your could affect fertility. Oh, I definitely have some things to share. So first, I just want to say before I forget that I've been watching the moon and it affects human behavior and emotions, the especially in the collective way for 20 years. And there's, there's undeniable aspect patterns that you can watch just people's moods change collectively in groups, group behavior in restaurants or in busy public environments, um, moods that correlate with the collective lunar phases. But then when you want to look at it a little bit more scientifically, um, there are situations like uh, when it comes to certain rainforests or not, I'm sorry, not rainforests, but forests that do, um, that harvest trees. So when the moon is full, it actually pulls all the moisture in the tree up to the top of the tree and they can't harvest because there's so much moisture and sap up in the top of the trees that it actually produces like a bleeding when they cut down the trees and that attracts pests. And then the pests attack all of the trees in the area. So there's harvest schedules for harvesting lumber that rely on using the new moon when the moisture is down in the root system and staying away from the full moon. And we all know about the tides. We also know that it affects animals eating and mating behavior. There's um, studies with crustaceous animals where they've taken them into laboratory conditions where they were not able to see the moon or have any um, natural light from the moon or sun come into the laboratory. And they proved without a doubt that the animals would still meet and mate and sleep according to moon cycle patterns that they were correlating um, by observation in nature. So there's a lot of different things that um, the moon affects that are maybe not so readily apparent, but when you pay very close attention, it is synchronized. Right. So just because mainstream science and medicine are not discussing the way that the moon affects us, it doesn't mean it's not true. It's something that humans have been aware of and working with since the beginning of humanity. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's one of the ways that we've tracked time and, and tracked the way that we move through the world. And just because we are not as deeply immersed in our natural environment anymore does not mean that we are um, exempt from it, that it doesn't affect us. So I, I find this very, very fascinating, this correlation that you draw with the lunar ovulation. You know what else is fascinating? The oldest art that you can find in caves is art depicting the lunar phases. So before we had technology and screens and all these other distractions, humans were obsessed with the moon and they were really paying attention. So this is where the wisdom of our ancestors really becomes important in this modern time. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and for anybody who listens to the earlier episode um, of Nectar, Sex, and Soul with Laura Carmody, she talked a lot about the ancient roots of women and their connection to the moon and their connection to the menstrual cycle and the information that they received from working with the moon in this way and how it informed the tribes. And um, it's, it's a very long lost wisdom that there are still people practicing, whether indigenous people or women who have reclaimed these ancient roots. And it's something that's very important to not dismiss just because it's not been uh, widely studied by mainstream science, because you have to remember, big pharma is not going to fund studies on this kind of thing. They, they don't give a shit. They don't profit off of it. And anything that empowers people to do things for free with the wisdom of their own bodies, with the offerings of the earth that they can't patent, they are not going to invest in the studies. And so I encourage everyone to keep an open mind about that. Absolutely. <clears throat> yeah. So I think you even, you mentioned earlier when we were talking, um, a documentary that kind of speaks to the capitalization on birth control. And uh, yeah, do you want to speak to that at all? Uh, yeah, so um, 
there's a new documentary out as of uh, spring of 2022 called The Business of Birth Control, which really exposes a lot of what is um, considered normal practice if you go to a doctor or a gynecologist to get birth control as really more um, programmed sales for pharmaceutical companies. It's protocol to describe or prescribe birth control um, for all sorts of women's issues. It becomes like an umbrella solve all when in reality, it's an endocrine disruptor and causes more issues with our hormonal systems. Our balance um, overall is so key because hormones affect everything. They affect your mood, they affect sleep, they affect your metabolism, they affect your sex drive. They literally affect everything that's going on in your body as a woman. And, you know, our current state of clinical studies and clinical trials for most medications is that they will um, study men and then approve something. And men have a 24 hour, 24 hour hormonal cycle, whereas women have a 28 day hormonal cycle. And we are so different and we are more sensitive because we're designed to do more in the reproductive arena um, in terms of becoming pregnant and bearing children. Yes, and this is a really great point too. That so much was so much of Western medicine bases its studies off of the male body, which functions completely differently than the female body. We are not the same. We are not the same. We are wired completely differently. Um, and yeah, that's that's something I could go on and on unpacking in so many ways. But um, I will say, you know, I was on birth control for seven years, definitely created all kinds of issues in my body. It took a long time for me to start having menstrual cycles again, for them to become regular again. Um, and, you know, I, I can speak from experience that my body is much healthier having been off of birth control and that using these methods, I've been able to prevent unwanted pregnancies for um, over a decade without contraceptives. So, uh, you know, we're, we're speaking from experience here as to the kinds of things that we've played with and explored and everyone's body is different. Uh, but I think it's, it's really important that everybody goes on a path of inquiry into what is the best option for them and to know that there are more options out there than what you are told by your doctor or Western medicine or the media and, and what have you. And so looking outside the box is, uh, in my opinion, extremely important when it comes to really protecting the health of our bodies and our reproductive systems. I agree with you because I've experienced the negative side effects of birth control, which I was put on at 16 for heavy periods. And by 17, I had polycystic ovarian syndrome, I have fibroids in my breast. I've had all sorts of issues related to hormones, um, including hormonal weight gain and skin issues and migraines and all kinds of things. So you may not be aware of that, or you might like gloss over when your doctor says it because you're really only t targeted on your goal of, I don't want to get pregnant, but these kinds of things, especially when you're using birth control for a long period of time can wreak havoc on your body. Yes. And I think this is, this is very important to be aware of that, um, you know, the body has its natural intelligence. It has its way of doing things. So when you just start taking a hormone blocker, uh, it's it's going to have side effects. It's going to ripple out in undesirable ways. I was put on it at age 14 for um, like cystic acne on my back and my chest. And, you know, that was probably connected to something entirely different that needed to be addressed with rebalancing my hormones rather than overriding them um, or my diet or toxicity that was in my body. You know, it's, it's like to slap a band-aid on a symptom with birth control um, and with, with many medications. I mean, you guys have all heard me talk about this, how like if we don't address the root, we're just kind of stuffing something down that's going to boil up somewhere else and then we've got a different fire to put out. Exactly. So, mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, you know, considering all factors um, as, you, as you explore these topics, I think it's very important topic actually that we discussed earlier that I think is, is good to touch on, which is um, the intention 
components that mm, can be woven into this. Do you want to speak to that at all? Oh, yes. Actually, thank you for bringing that up because I think that no matter what your situation is, your thoughts are signals to the universe and they're like the first things that start to bring stuff into matter. And if you have an intention, even if you're like speaking about the future, in my own experience, when I got unexpectedly pregnant, I was having excited, you know, new relationship energy and a lot of amazing sex with my partner. And we were like, this is love. We're so wildly in love. Let's have children in the future. Let's talk about our plans. And we got pregnant so much sooner because, you know, if you follow the train of thought of like, your subconscious doesn't know the difference between time, like now and um, the future. It also mm-hmm. doesn't know the difference between not wanting something and you can negatively manifest. Um, it doesn't understand negatives. So I think, you know, your intention really does play a role. And um, I found myself in a situation where I was saying out loud and conversing with my partner that we'd like to have a family in the future and we got pregnant within a few months of knowing each other and I had just recently broken my back and the timing was really not right so um that led me to the difficult situation that a lot of women find themselves in when they get pregnant unexpectedly in an unplanned way which by the way happens to 45 percent of women in of all pregnancies in America are unplanned which is startling in a country that is supposed to be um you know have access to the most privilege and quality healthcare and information clearly there's something wrong here if that is the case um but i found myself in that situation and you're faced with the difficult situation of do i keep this or do i um choose a way to abort it and at the time um i attempted an herbal abortion but i was Uh, several weeks pregnant up by the time I decided that that's what I wanted to do because let me tell you when your hormones are pregnant your biology everything says keep this keep this keep this even if you know it's not the right situation Um, even if your partner is not down which mine was not and um, I attempted to find information about herbal abortion and I did on a website called Sister Zeus Um, so I read everything that I possibly could and tried and was unsuccessful at herbal abortion. And once you begin, um, trying to have an herbal abortion, taking herbs, you have to follow through with an abortion, uh, because the, what happens is the risk of, um, birth defect or other health complications with the, um, growing embryos, I go, uh, it becomes really high once you start taking these herbs that can come in and disrupt pregnancy hormone and growth hormone and all sorts of things. So I did end up having to have a medical procedure abortion. And after that experience, I wouldn't wish that on anyone ever. Um, So, you know, even though I'm convicted that I made the right choice, I I just wouldn't wish anyone to have to go into a fluorescently lit room and stare at a poster of a beach on the ceiling while somebody um, does a very invasive and traumatic procedure on your body and then reads you state-sanctioned, basically shaming about this afterwards. Plus, you know, encountering the picket line on the outside. Um, So like, you know, that was my first experience with an unplanned pregnancy. And I can share about the second one, unless you have anything that you want to reflect or ask any questions about that first one first. Yeah, I'll speak a little bit to that. Um, Yeah, you know, like listening, listening to you speak, it's it's like, I think there's, there's so much that goes into this, right? Like, I think we can, we can want it to be such a cut and dry solution. Like, give me a pill and just tell me I won't get pregnant. And it's more nuanced than that. And there are many different factors that play into it physically, emotionally, mentally, energetically, spiritually. Um, 
And the intention is a really interesting piece because we, we create, we have the capacity to create life with our sexual energy. That is our raw, creative, God self energy. And people take this for granted. I think people don't think about what a crazy thing that it is that we have the capacity to create other humans. And then that we do that through orgasm, that we do that through sex. Like it's pretty mind blowing to me. It's not such a like casual, whatever thing. And, um, you know, so, so many people are doing it in an accidental way or in a way that is not uh, intentional. And I'm, I'm very fascinated by the concept of uh, conscious conception and, and really choosing to create life with intention and prayer and creating the space for it. And there's that phrase that uh, be careful what you wish for, because an unconscious wizard is a wizard nonetheless. And so you could be, yeah. So just like you were saying, you know, we, we are powerful manifestors and we have the capacity to speak things into being and we can do that negatively. So, you know, when I, when I teach men to um, expand and prolong pleasure, to move into the realm of seminal retention and non ejaculate for orgasm, I emphasize to them, it's really important that you are not in this space of trying to last longer thinking, don't come, don't come, don't come. <laughs> because then really all you're thinking about is coming. You know, and if I say, don't think of a purple elephant, what did you just think <laughs> of? It's like, it, the, the subconscious mind does not understand negatives. And so if you're going into this space of like, I hope I don't get pregnant, I hope I don't get pregnant, Again, your body is just thinking pregnancy, pregnancy. And, and, and even you, you know, having this, this energy um, and this intention with your partner to create life, like all of it plays into it, right? Like it all has an imprint. And so we could, we could say it was the lunar ovulation. We could say it was the intention. We could say, well, science can't explain it. So we don't know what the hell it was. <laughs> <laughs> That's a cough out. <laughs> But like, uh, yeah, I think it's so important to look at the various different elements that play into it. Yeah. I totally agree. They're, they're I, so I, multifaceted. Mm-hmm. And I, I think really a huge piece of what we're looking at here is the systemic um, disconnection and lack of education of women and their bodies. Like there, there has been you know, personally, I think a lot of it has been by design. Um, I think a lot of like folklore, like, um, you know, kind of tribal wisdom, um, ancient medicine, these kinds of things. I think a lot of it received a lot of negative propaganda against it in favor of Western medicine. And people were convinced that none of that was sophisticated. None of it was modern. It didn't work. It was just, um, myth and and legend you know like there there is so much dismissal of these ancient ways that humans had been working with for so long and such an emphasis on telling women that they don't know what's best for their bodies and that they have to put that power in the hands of a practitioner who quote unquote knows more than they do because they are educated but no practitioner knows your body as well as you do and it is your responsibility to get to know your body as well as you possibly can. And that's something that, that I learned in my journey with chronic illness is that I was, I was dealing with all these practitioners who were trying to tell me what was best for me. And, and some of them, I was like, where did you get a medical license? Like, you have no idea what you're talking about. Like, I can tell you so much more about my condition and the research I've done and what I'm experiencing. And, and you're just literally pulling stuff out of your ass. Like it's, it was, it was mind blowing to me. Um, and I, I know so many people who have gone through similar experiences, but what I came to realize is like, no, I, I don't have, um, I haven't gone to med school. Like I'm not a trained medical professional, but I know my body better than any of these practitioners do. And it's my responsibility to continue deepening that relationship and learning the wisdom of my body and listening to my body so that I can guide this process as best I can with the help of practitioners who I do trust, who do feel like they know what they're talking about. So I agree. That's been my experience too. 
Mm -hmm. So I, I, I just want to speak that I think that's like a huge crux of this issue here is that we have become disempowered um, when it comes to having agency over our bodies and our health and that that's not something that the government can give back to us. Um, and it's not something they could have taken from us had we, you know, been aware of what we, what they were doing or, you know, had we stayed connected to our bodies in that way. It's, it's technically not something that they can take to us, take from us. It's been within us all along. So to me, this is a journey of coming home to that innate wisdom that has always been here that we've only lost touch with. Yeah. And I thank you for speaking to that. And I just want to add that like it, this predates our government. Uh, there's a documentary called the burning times that talks about how over a thousand years, they estimate that 9 million women and children were put to death for heresy, which includes practicing herbal stuff or heresy from the church or witchcraft, which includes having any power over your own ability to have children because you know, power, it's not that they had an agenda that we're going to disempower. It's just that they were seeking power. And that's been the case, seeking power, seeking money. Um, the pharmaceutical industry has existed since, uh, the, for a very, since almost the beginning of this country, starting with like, um, you can do your own research to see like where it originated and it originated from the Rockefeller family centuries ago already. And so, you know, this type of power, actually, it's, there were wise women that held the type of power that where they could be sovereign with their wounds, where they could be sovereign with their bodies. And that was, they were sought to eradicate that because it was considered, uh, you know, desirable for uh, men or the church or, or even the local government to have more control over that type of thing. Because, you know, if the sheriff's wife lost a pregnancy that she had because she went to see the witch doctor he's got reason not to want that but they uncover that actually the primary reason for the witch trials was money because they could um charge the witch for money for her arrest for her jailing for her trial and they would take her land because there were a lot of wise widows who had inherited land wow. so check that out i mean it's still happening today just in a totally different form Wow. Mm. Yeah. And I, I will add that if your agenda is to seek control, a wonderful tactic to do that is to disconnect people from their sexuality. And sexually empowered people are a fucking force to be reckoned with. And sexually disempowered people are complacent. They're easy to control. I've, I've spoken to this in other episodes. It's, it's why slaves have been castrated um why why we castrate animals and we want to domesticate them it's because that is vitality it's life force it's a wildness to to our humanity and, and to animals as well and women who are sexually empowered they know how to ask for what they want they know how to go after what they want um they, they don't need to ask for what they want. You know, they, they are, they're a force to be reckoned with. And I think it's absolutely no accident that in the oppression of women over the past several thousand years, that disconnecting them from their sexuality has been an instrumental piece in keeping them complacent and um, able to control. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, um, you know, so many things that go into this and this is re reclaiming our procreative sovereignty is, is so much bigger than just pregnancy prevention and, and like choice over our bodies. It's, it's, it's really reclaiming our sovereignty on so many levels and, you know, how we show up in this world and, and how we run our energy and who we give our power away to. And um, so this is, yeah, I see this as an incredible act of reclamation for what it is to be a free human. I totally agree. So yeah, let's, let's move into uh, the herbal piece. Um, you know, that's, that's another thing that I know you've worked with extensively and have a lot of wisdom to share about. So 
Yeah. Would you like to start us off by sharing a little bit of your wisdom around that? Sure. Okay. So I mentioned earlier that I attempted an herbal abortion uh, the first time that I was um, found myself unexpectedly pregnant. Mm -hmm. And um, I mentioned a good resource for that. And let me say, I read tons of accounts of other women and um, read all the recommended things. I tried combinations of herbs um, and I was unsuccessful. Another time I was with a man who was very much into the pharmaceutical world and we had differing viewpoints, but um, we broke a condom and he um, insisted that I take plan B. And so I did, and it really messed me up. I got pretty sick for like 24 hours and not only did that happen, but it completely threw off my um, hormones in a way that threw off my menstrual cycle, which before that you could, I could pick the days, 28 days regular down the calendar. And um, I would always know which day my period was coming and suddenly it was thrown off. And then um, what happened was I, I didn't realize that had been thrown off and we had broke another condom and um, I got pregnant this time knowing uh, that the earliest warning sign of pregnancy is implantation bleeding. That's what they call it. Because the theory is that that is when the egg actually attaches to the uterine lining. And what happens in a woman will you'll have a, a day where you spot, um, but you don't actually get your period the next day or the day after that or the day after that. And so it's the earliest warning sign. And I knew to look out from that for my, for my first experience. And um, I became concerned when um, my um, period did not show up uh, on time. And then uh, I think two or three days later, I had a day of spotting and then nothing happened. And so I took action immediately and I went back to Sister Zeus and checked all the herbs and I used a combination of um, vitamin C without uh, rhioflavonoids because they counteract it somehow. Um, black cohosh, dong quai. Um, I'm trying to remember, and I don't think I use Queen Anne's lace now that I think about it further, because I probably would have been using it as a preventative. Um, but I also had um, some essential oil of Penny Royal and everything I read, and I wouldn't recommend this at home, but this is what I chose to do for myself. Um, I did not want to go through the trauma of another uh, medical procedure abortion. And I knew um, from speaking with my partner that he was not down to play the role of father. And um, we had had discussions about not having kids prior to this. So I took uh, things into my own hands and I used those herbs I mentioned a moment ago, as well as I had read that high dosages of pennyroyal can be lethal because it's highly toxic. So I used a trace amount by running my finger over the rim of the bottle and wiping my finger off and then touching it to my tongue. And I can tell you that my body felt the effects of that. It's really hard on the liver and the kidneys. And I felt pain in my kidneys. But also within a few hours of doing that, my, my, I was laying in bed and I was reading and I was meditating and setting my intention really strongly that um, I was going to get my period. And I use that as a, my intention to, I'm going to get my period. Uh, anything that may, ha may happen to an egg, whatever may happen to an egg, it will be released from my body. Um, so I felt my uterus and my like actually quiver. I felt my womb shake and um, a short while after that, I began my period. So like, again, disclaimer, I'm not a medical expert, but that is what I used to successfully have an herbal abortion. If I could go back and tell myself um, better advice, I would say to have someone who knows what you're doing, stand by and to know um, that if there's any potential problems that you need to go seek medical advice from a trusted person. And honestly, I would choose an herbalist or a 
um, someone who is intimately familiar with women's fertility in the natural um, realm over a medical MD or a gynecologist. Mm -hmm. Um, and I would also say that it is very important that you know how to care for your liver and kidneys. Um, if you're exposing yourself to the toxicity, the potential toxicity of um, herbs that are strong enough to do that uh, afterwards to repair any damage that might happen. Uh, there are milder herbs that can be used, but the key is really to begin as soon as you know that you might be pregnant or even as soon as you know implantation bleeding has occurred and you're not getting your period or as soon as you have a positive test result. Uh, you have to begin immediately in order to potentially have success. And even in that case, you know, there are many accounts on Sister Zeus, like I mentioned, a real woman uh, attempting herbal abortions and, you know, her um, overall feedback is that uh, beginning sooner is a higher success rate, but it's still not 100%. It, it, each woman's different. Every case is different. And the fertility mysteries are um, mysteries for a reason. I don't think that, you know, even with all the science that we have, that we could ever fully understand every single pregnancy and the uh, mechanics behind it. Yeah. So that's one piece to speak mm -hmm. to um, what's possible. Before you get into the next piece, I just want to, I just want to like invite everyone to take, take these two stories in of like what this woman um, endured without the help of a partner playing a role in any of this. Like this, this was put on her to sort out. Like the effects of aborting a pregnancy were put entirely on her body. And this has been the norm, the expectation. Like the, yeah, of course, she's gonna take the plan B. She's gonna get the abortion. She's gonna take the birth control. Okay, I want everyone to let that sink in, especially the men who have ever like subscribed to that way of thinking and not to guilt you or shame you, but to help you open to a new perspective on how unfair that is, how traumatic that is. Nobody wants to have an abortion. We want to have them as an option. We don't want that to be the preventative, you know, like we, we want to have a way that we go about that um, to, to prevent that at all costs. And by men not choosing to play a role in this for so long, beyond some of them being willing to wear condoms, which on a whole, you know, side note, uh, a lot of men really argue about wearing condoms when women request it. And, and then some men getting vasectomies and then a very, which by the way, a vasectomy is a much less invasive process than a woman having her tubes tied. Um, and, and then a very small percentage of men learning the art of seminal retention. And the, the journey of a man learning to retain his seed causes no harm to his body and actually opens up an entirely new realm of pleasure. Whereas the things that we have been expecting and asking women to do for so long cause enormous harm to the system um, in the event of like, yeah, birth control, plan B, abortion, like, and, and, and trauma. Like this is a very heavy thing for a woman to go through. And so I just invite you to notice like in those stories, the man was not a super active role in preventing this or in, in sorting it out once, you know, once it happened. Um, so let that, let that just sit with you and like take that into your heart and, and like open to a new way of, of empathizing with the burden that women have carried. Also being the ones who are going to have to carry the child and give birth and physically be the one with the baby in the event that a pregnancy occurs, whereas men can dip out if they want to, you know, they, they should be showing up, they should be paying child support, but the enormous 
burden that is placed on women and that for so many people, it doesn't even cross their minds that that's ridiculous, that it like, yeah, it, it took two to make this happen. Why is this just falling on the woman? Um, just want to like, let that land for a little bit. Yeah. And I want to add that there's the burden of um, taboo of speaking about it and getting proper um, counseling or therapy or even just support from your friends or family who may not feel in alignment with abortion. So the majority of women who experience this go through this entirely alone. And when you get pregnant, your hormones are activated for a nine month journey, whether you abort or miscarry or whatever. So you're going through that hormonal ride of pregnancy a lot of times by yourself in a situation where you don't feel like you want to burden your friends with discussing this over and over again, even though you're dealing with it. And not that you're like coming from a place of regretting your actions, you're coming from a hormonal, emotional processing of what you experienced and letting those things play out for the time that you would have been pregnant. So that's another thing that like, if you're an experience, if you are a man and you are with a partner who experiences um, a miscarriage or uh, any other, you know, way that a pregnancy might end, be aware that she's going to need extra support for a length of time. Yeah. Thank you for speaking to that. It's a whole other dimension of complexity and heaviness that a lot of people don't ever think about or have to experience, you know, and so many women are left to deal with this on their own. Like, and there, there is a huge stigma around it. And even the fact that so many people are shamed for being pro-choice um, because, you know, the, the people doing that shaming can't put themselves in the shoes of what it is to be in a woman who is in the position of having to make that decision. Absolutely. Okay. Well, Thank you for sharing so vulnerably about your experience with this um, and, and letting us into that piece of your journey and, and just really, yeah, have so much love and respect for you for enduring that and then transmuting it into something amazing that you can share with other women to help them be empowered in their journey around procreative sovereignty. I can honestly say it's my pleasure to share at this point in time. It has been alchemized. Awesome. So yeah, circling back to uh, the herbal, the herbal piece of things, what did you want to share with us about working with herbs? So the other piece that's really cool to know about is that there is an herb called wild carrot or queen Anne's lace that is an implantation inhibitor. And I found out about this when I wanted to get off birth control 14 years ago. And um, there's very little um, studies done on it. I think I only personally know of one and it was not a clinical trial. It was a study done by Robin Rose Bennett, an herbalist who's put in many decades uh, to earn, um, earn her wisdom. And she put it together um, and by the way, this, this herb has been used for thousands of years to prevent pregnancy. And um, it functions by making it so that even if an egg were to be fertilized by a sperm, it cannot nest into the uterine lining and um, stay there to be, to continue growing. So um, there's different ideas about how this herb can be used in terms of protocol. And um, again, with a disclaimer that like nothing is a hundred percent for going to work for anyone. And also I want to add that, you know, lots of FDA approved birth control fails women constantly. I know tons of women who've gotten pregnant on the pill or IUDs or um, patches or rings or lots of things. Um, or even plan B fails them. Um, so, you know, we don't have any 1000% accurate ways, but I think that eliminating the side effects um, of other options is a really great way to give yourself an edge. Plus 
the benefits are that you only need to use it as needed. It can be taken afterwards. You don't have to take it before. Uh, you only need a small amount. Um, it can be taken in many different forms. You can work with the tincture, you can work with the seeds. A huge caveat here is that you need to know how to identify Queen Anne's lace and differentiate it from poison hemlock or other lookalikes that won't have the same effects, uh, especially because poison hemlock is poisonous. Um, and you'll find false information out there that Queen Anne's lace is poisonous, and that is absolutely not true. It's just someone who doesn't know how to identify the difference between poison hemlock and Queen Anne's lace. Um, so that's an option that I think women need to know about and um, that, you know, is one of those things that is lost wisdom because of efforts to control <laughs> or efforts to um, make it appear as though those who have alternative and natural solutions um, or natural options are, you know, they're the quacks when really they're not. Um, hmm. So, yeah, actually, I did want to hear a little bit about um, just your experience working with it because you've been using it for 10 years successfully, yeah? Uh, longer even. Um, when I began, I had a partner and we were very sexually active, like at once or twice a day at least. And um, an herbalist friend told me how to use it and she had wildcrafted some and um, I had no issues with it ever. Uh, I still recommend it to other women. Um, the one side effect that I'm aware of is that it can make your period a little bit heavier and a little bit shorter because it's working to release the uterine lining. So it's going to... Um, shed a little quicker in some cases and not everybody even experiences that so I think it's a great option um, that doesn't mess with your hormones in the way that synthetic hormones or hormone blockers do um, and it's you know it's amazing that you only need to think about it or take it in a limited quantity when you need it absolutely Absolutely. And in combination with some of these other methods that we're talking about with tracking with fertility awareness method, with understanding your linear ovulation, with working with seminal retention, it's like we can stack these different tools, these different approaches to have a very well-rounded uh, safety net and not just be relying so heavily on, on one side of it, but really approaching it from different angles. Absolutely. I think that makes the most sense. Okay. So one more thing I wanted to ask you about based upon what we were speaking to you earlier is that we, we can work with conception intentionally. And I think we can also work with abortion intentionally. And you had some pretty wild stories that you shared with me earlier before we started recording about the concept of spiritual abortions. And I would love to hear a little bit about that. Thank you for asking. I think that's such an important topic. Um, there is this seed was planted. I, I want to say that it came to me through two avenues. And one of them was the idea on the Sister Zeus website about releasing, she calls it the entity, but like releasing the spirit of the child that wants to be born through you. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about my personal belief system. Um, I've been into energy healing and energy work and energy systems for a long time. And uh, it is my understanding that the soul of a child is considered a baby thing until it is born. And they essentially like kind of choose you. Um, they kind of like choose parents and they're like trying to come down through, um, through the portal of the mother into this realm. And um, they can... And my understanding is that they can make you very horny. <laughs> and, um, but also like they become attached to you at the time of conception and working with the intention of releasing that soul and just sort of lovingly, sweetly, like saying like, thank you for choosing me. And this is not the right time. I'm so honored that I would really like you to release. 
So simply using a prayer of some kind in that format is incredibly powerful. Um, and one of my favorite spiritual teachers on the subject of energy, anatomy, and working with spirit is Carolyn Miss. And I believe that she talks about um, a woman in Arizona who uh, performs spiritual abortions on people. So um, being that I've been working in uh, energetic medicine in the spirit realm for a while now, I was like, okay, well, I, if this is possible, just simply knowing it's possible, I think that this is something that women, women might want to know and consider as an option. And I did have a friend whose identity I'm not going to reveal, um, who became pregnant unexpectedly and um, simply worked with her own spiritual connection. We sort of designed a ritual for her together and she performed it on her own and used absolutely nothing except for intention and spiritual power and um, like calling in her own spiritual allies to induce a miscarriage that evening. So I, I want people to know that you really have so much power, so much more power than you've ever been led to believe spiritually and over your physical body. Absolutely. The power of belief is so strong, so strong. And, you know, there's, there's all kinds of, um, all kinds of teachings on the power of belief and and what it can do to kind of override reality as we know it. And so I think it's absolutely a worthwhile thing to work with. And again, like something that might come off as really woo to hear this. And I, I definitely have known many people who like felt that being circling, you know, in, in their vicinity before they became pregnant, who felt that there was someone that was trying to come through. Um, I have personally felt that in, in my time and was very clear in my intention that it was, it was not the time. Um, and, and, you know, clear and in, in tracking with my body and just taking responsibility for ensuring that I did not become pregnant when I didn't want to. So, um, you know, I, I think when you when you start to hear a lot of different people talk about these similar experiences, like sure you can dismiss it if you want, but I, I think it's um, very curious to to see it come up time and time again. Oh, I have something to add to that. I have a dear friend who had her um, her deceased mother bring her children to the spirit of her unborn children to her to introduce them and and like like uh just formally introduce them in her dreams and um she's known she's very in tune she's very um aware that like these children then were coming back to like visit her uh, in dreams and sometimes in waking um in waking states where she was sort of like you know in meditation or trance they would appear and um, I'm very happy to say that we worked together um, to learn, like, to time um, pregnancy and to look at the astrological stuff. And I helped her find her lunar ovulation. And she's pregnant now and expecting the first one to be born soon. Wow. Wow. That's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. It really makes my heart so happy. Uh, that's amazing. That's amazing. Well, yeah, there's 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 so many uh, components to the topic of discussion today, and and so many directions we could go with this. I feel like we could talk about it all day. Um, and I I, I want to speak to seminal retention a bit in this episode. Um, I'm going to do further episodes on seminal retention because this is something I've specialized in teaching men for years, it's something very near and dear to my heart um, that feels more important than ever now with the current political climate, the current state of affairs. And, you know, we've, we've gotten to hear all this wisdom from Elsa about what women can do. And there is so much focus on what women can do to prevent pre pregnancy. I wanna bring some attention to what men can do. I want to rewrite the narrative that this is just a woman's issue, that abortion is a woman's issue. 
Um, this is this is a human's issue. This is something that men need to be paying attention to as well. And I've seen a lot of men post on social media and say things like, what can men do to support you? So your voice is important on this topic. And in, in many ways, even more importantly, your capacity to be at choice as to when and if you ejaculate and to develop masterfully refined control in that respect is one of the most incredible things you could do to support women and to take responsibility for your peace and to reclaim procreative sovereignty on your end of things. Because, you know, if you get a woman pregnant and you don't want to be a father and she doesn't want to go through an abortion, like you're going to be a father. So, and it's, it's not your right to force her to have an abortion. It is on you to do everything you can to prevent an unplanned pregnancy. And it's very important that you guys have conversations and agreements around what your backup plan is if an unplanned pregnancy occurs. And for you to, to also be aware that like, she might say, yes, I'll have an abortion. And it is on her to honor that agreement as best she can. But there are times when a woman who thought she was gonna have an abortion becomes pregnant, pregnant, and it's, it's like, this is not the right thing. Like, I am meant to have this child. I cannot go through with this abortion. And ultimately, it is her body, her choice, and you have to support that. So if you don't like that, um, if you don't want to be a father, or, you know, if you don't want to be a father yet, or if you don't ever want your woman to have to go through these things that can cause harm to her body, if you love women and you care about their well-being, this is one of the most important things you can do. Um, go ahead. And their pleasure. And I, cause I can tell you the difference between having a partner who understands this practice and a, a partner who doesn't. I've introduced this practice to men just because I have so much better sex and we have better, it's just better if a man knows how to do this. So men, listen up. It is. I mean, it, it, it enables you to have basically infinite stamina. Like you can go and go and go and you can unlock an entirely new type of orgasm that is a full body rolling, non ejaculatory orgasm, which is very similar to when you see women have multiple orgasms and they can be in this expanded orgasmic state where it's not even like, oh, one, two, three orgasms. It's like an hour of <laughs> orgasmic bliss, hours, yeah. You can do that as a man. That is also available to you. I hear so many men saying, oh, I'm so jealous that women are multi-orgasmic. Well, you also have that ability. And it is harder work to learn how to do it. It doesn't come as naturally to men as it does to women. Um, but it is a very worthwhile endeavor. Totally. And can I just please tell you, some men can master this in under a week because I've seen it. Yeah, it's true. It can happen very quickly. It all depends on your starting point. You know, I've seen some men, it can take years. Some men, it can take a week. If you're, you know, very addicted to porn, if you've been compulsively masturbating, it's going to take longer to rewire this. Um, but if you have an intentional masturbation practice where you are rewiring the way you connect with your body and listen to your sexual energy, you can, you can learn this very quickly. And if you have a lover who is on board with it, who can support you in this journey, and you guys can be in communication, that can go much faster too. And that's that's how my partner ultimately learned was through us working together. And all of it is a communication, right? So as a woman, like you need to tell your man where you are in your cycle, like let him know when you're coming up on your fertile window, like that's something that you have to be on point about and, and letting him know. And he needs to be telling you when he's getting close to his edge or if you need to slow down or, you know, like he, he has to be tracking and communicating and you have to be listening to his body as well. Because when a man is learning this practice and he doesn't have quite as great of control over everything, it's, it's a great idea to use condoms during this time uh, to have a backup. And if you're not listening to his body and you can't read the signs of when he's approaching his edge, and then you just thrust your hips super intensely and push it over his edge, 
Like that's, that's on you to be paying attention to. This is a team effort. We are on the same team working towards shared intentions. So we need to not get into like finger pointing, blame and shame and expectation that the other person does all the work. We need to come together and do this as a team. So seven more retention guys, it's, you know, there's, there's multiple different expressions of this. You could just be withholding your seed and you are just very much at choice as to when you ejaculate. You could take it a giant step further and become multi-orgasmic and work with sublimation and not ejaculatory orgasm because ejaculation and orgasm are actually two separate functions. Most people don't realize this. They happen within milliseconds of one another, but they can be separated. And some of you guys have maybe had an ejaculation without an orgasm um, or have stumbled upon an, an orgasm without an ejaculation. Some men do accidentally tap into this. But like, oh my God, what was that? So they can be separated. Um, and, and when you have a non-ejaculatory orgasm, you are taking edging at one huge further step where you're reversing the flow of energy and circulating through your whole body and having a full body orgasm. Um, so it's very different than just choosing not to come. It's not that you have to give up your orgasm. Um, and even if you just got to the point where you knew how to choose when and if you're going to ejaculate, like that's, even if you don't master the non-ejaculatory orgasm, that's still very helpful uh, for preventing pregnancy. So this is about cultivating a very deep relationship with your sexual energy and recognizing that ejaculation is a function that is intended for creating life. And most orgasms are not happening with the intention of creating life. And so if we can be more intentional about that and be at choice as to what type of experience we want to have, that can be really helpful. So for me personally, um, I did not know about the linear ovulation until talking about it with Elsa. And that's a really great piece of information to know and understand. And my cycle has not been um, perfectly regular. You know, it varies by a couple days here and there over the years. Um, but for the past decade, I have tracked my cycle and my partner has um, had you know, incredible control over his, over his seed. And he only ejaculates every two to three months. Um, and when he does ejaculate, it's not like an accidental thing. Like it's, it's very much a choice and he knows when it's going to happen. I personally don't even risk having my partner come inside of me. And that's probably part of why this has worked so well for me because I haven't been like risking things during lunar ovulation. And because he has such masterful control over his seed that we're not risking anything slipping through. Um, and I think that can be a really great way to go to have an added layer of protection to just not even be receiving semen into your yoni. But some women really, that's really important to them that they, they really want to have that. And so there are all these different methods that we talked about today with fertility awareness method and tracking the lunar ovulation and working with things like Queen Anne's lace and learning seminal retention that can all layer to create a much more um, effective approach to preventing unwanted pregnancy. And I think it's really worth trying to pull multiple of those approaches into the game plan and to have a backup option. And, you know, my, my prayer is that we will overturn this whole recent overturn and that abortion will be available and legal for everyone to happen in a safe way. Um, and while we are working on that, it's it's really important that we take matters into our own hands where we can and be reclaiming our sovereignty and not relying on abortion as the only option. And, you know, there are all kinds of people who are probably not going to assemble upon this podcast who need this the most, marginalized communities and um, people who don't necessarily play in the realms of like this kind of podcast. And so I really encourage people to share these messages far and wide, to share this episode with people you love, to spread the word and to talk about this stuff, to destigmatize the 
um, taboo around talking about this kind of thing because it's important and we need to be in communication and we need to be supporting each other and not just placing them, not just placing this on women and considering this to be solely a women's issue. Elsa, is there anything else that you want to add to all of this um, before we start to wrap up here? I just want to reflect that the it was super interesting to hear you say that, you know, orgasm and ejaculation can be separated because that's true for women too. And so, I mean, it show most women separate those things naturally and men can learn to do it too. So yeah. I just thought that was interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. Our bodies are miraculous. They are so incredibly magical and there's so much about them. We don't understand, especially sexually. And so you know, for people who want to dive into this, you know, do your research. Like there are so many resources available. Elsa and I both have so much to offer as it pertains to all the topics we've talked about today, which we'll get to in, in just a little bit here. But I think, you know, one of the core points I really want to drive home in this episode is that we can be way more intentional with how we are running our sexual energy. We can be way more intentional with the way we take responsibility for getting to know our bodies and being in communication with our bodies so that we can be at choice rather than relying on any one method or what's happening um, with the government or like relying on our partner to have it figured out, right? I want to really drive home that this is a team effort and we all have a responsibility to do our part. And I think if everyone were practicing the kinds of things we talked about today, we'd have a much smaller rate of unplanned pregnancies and a much smaller need for abortions. So, you know, it's, it's an amazing pragmatic way to move the needle forward and really appreciate everyone uh, listening to these, these ideas with an open mind. And again, of course, using them at your own risk and, and having safety nets in place as you explore them. Um, yeah, I, we definitely used condoms while we were getting down the non-ejaculatory orgasm thing. And it's, it's really helpful to, um, just, you know, have, have your backup plans in case something doesn't go as planned. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, Elsa, thank you so much for being here today and for sharing so generously of your wisdom. It's so amazing to get to have this conversation with you. Uh, how can people dive deeper into your world and into your work? Um, okay, so the best way to find me is at my website. It's cosmicfox.co, C-O. And I have multiple offerings. You can come seek me out for advanced astrology readings. I do much more than um, fertility and pregnancy stuff. I can help you find your lunar ovulation if you can't figure that out on your own. It's relatively simple in terms of learning the phase of the moon that you're born under and then looking up when that phase occurs again and using that time. But I, um, I like to math it out because I'm a little bit of an astrology nerd. So I actually get like mathematical with the degrees of separation between the sun and the moon and um, give you that, that um, what that equates to in days and hours. Um, although I don't believe nature is quite that precise, it's nice to know if you love specific numbers. Um, another thing that I offer, I love that you mentioned Soraya about, um, learning how to run your energy and how to, uh, control your sexual energy. Well, I also offer that with more than just your sexual energy, with your emotional, physical, uh, your psychic energy. Um, so people who do one-on-one -on -one mentorships with me, uh, can look at uh, what types of energy hygiene they need to be doing, what sorts of energy cultivation they need to be doing. And I help teach practices and tools, which can often be a really big opener for um, your psychic facilities uh, and your intuition, because there is a connection. Like sister chakras are the second and sixth. So there's a total connection there and there's also a total connection between the throat and the yoni very uh, much mm -hmm. but when it comes to the chakras there's a connection also between uh the sixth chakra and the second 
Um, so that's another way to work with me. And um, in light of this Roe versus Wade thing, um, I would like to uh, gift bottles of organic Queen Anne's Lace to women who are especially, especially to those that are affected um, by the um, abortion laws in states that have trigger abortion laws or six week bans or pretty much anything. Um, and, you know, even I, I just want to gift it. I want to give this medicine to the people. And so if you go to my website, you can, um, in, by the time this podcast comes out, there'll be a pop-up to join my email list and you'll get an email that tells you how to get some Queen Anne's Lace and all you have to pay for is the shipping and handling. Beautiful. Thank you so, so much for that generous offering. I think that's a super important thing for um, people to be getting their hands on and doing their research about and, you know, exploring these new avenues. So thank you so much for making that available and I encourage everyone to just continue doing, doing your own research. Like take this as a springboard to go learn um, about these various different methods more deeply. And to the men who are wanting to do your part and embark on your path of sexual mastery for greater pleasure, stamina, and also procreative sovereignty, I am actually offering 40% off on my multi-orgasmic vitality for men's course. It's one of my signature courses. Um, it's an amazing gift to give to yourself and your current or future lover. It's um, yeah, truly an amazing course that I've poured so much love into that many men have been through and tapped into completely new dimensions of their sexual expression and experience. And so that's going to be on sale uh, for all of cancer season because cancer season is the, the month there, the moon, the womb, the breasts, the, the female reproductive system. And it's a really potent time to honor the women and honor the health of, of their wounds and their reproductive systems. Let's not keep expecting them to undergo such harsh processes to have procreative sovereignty. So thank you. Men, listening. Go ahead. men, I totally encourage you to take Soraya's class because I've taken her classes and she really is an amazing fountain of knowledge and she has so much to offer. So if you really want to give yourself like the greatest ego boost ever, learn to become a better lover, please, do <laughs> or please your woman and take care of her. That's what like, take responsibility for it all. That's what healthy masculine does. It's it's truly so good for you know the the body mind and soul for your vitality and for your health. I'll speak to the benefits in much more detail in future episodes. It's something I plan to unpack a lot more, but I encourage you to get a head start on it. And um, with with Chiron being in Aries, this is very much a, a time of, of healing the you know the wounded masculine and the distorted masculine. And there's been all this talk about toxic masculinity, and I think it's really important that we are constructive in the way we discuss these topics. I love men. I love masculinity. We need men to be supporting the change that we wish to see. We can't be emasculating them and blaming and shaming them. We need to team up with them and lift each other up. So um, yeah, you know, else is an amazing resource on if you want to dive into the, the Chiron and Aries, if you want to look at where in your chart you have, you know, like what time periods of your life you are most likely to, you know, be in, be in a space of conception or which areas you might actually struggle with fertility issues or, you know, she, she's able to really read the stars in an incredible way that can help you have a compass as to how to navigate your life more effectively. Um, personally, she, she gave me some advice um, when I had a course launch that did not go nearly as well as I anticipated. It broke even. And um, she looked at my astrology and was like, yeah, you launched us at a really inopportune time for where the stars were in, in your chart. And she helped me outline some more um, auspicious times that I could be launching courses. And it, it really had a huge impact. Um, and so I actually use astrology every single day and how I run my business and other, other areas of my life. So I... I very much encourage you to check out her work and I hope that you have all found this podcast to be 
inspirational and educational and empowering. And if there's anything you've loved from it, um, please, please, please share it with the people you love. If there was a quote that stood out to you and you want to share it in your Instagram stories and your social media and tag us in it, we would love that. Uh, but if you, you know, if you want to help the change ripple out, please help the word spread. We super appreciate the reciprocity in spreading the word if you if you loved what you received here today. So thank you, Elsa, so much for being here. I love you, sister. I love you too. Thank you. It's been an honor. And thanks yeah. everybody for listening. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. It's been another beautiful episode of Nectar, Sex, and Soul. As always, please leave a review or a rating. Uh, you can leave a rating on the app on Spotify. If it's updated, you can leave a review on Apple. Those go a super long way in spreading the word, helping the algorithms. Super appreciate that. Um, loving you all so much. Have a beautiful rest of your day. And please, please keep in mind that we hold so much more power within than we realize. And this is a scary time for a lot of people. There's a lot of panic. The more we can come together and support each other in cultivating pragmatic solutions, the more we're going to move the needle forward in getting through this. And I think this has the potential to be an absolutely revolutionary time for humanity. So in the same way that Elsa alchemized these unexpected pregnancies into absolute medicine to offer the collective, I think we can do the same with this situation. So. Thank you all so much. Have a beautiful rest of your day. Ciao. Thank you so much for dropping into Nectar, Sex, and Soul with me today. It's been a pleasure to connect with you. If this episode lit you up or illuminated something impactful for you in some way, I invite you to subscribe, leave a review, and share it with someone you feel would love to hear it. To learn more about my work, check out SoreyaLeonara.com, sign up for my newsletter, and follow me on Instagram and YouTube, where I share tons of free content, special offers, and ensure you're the first to know about my new offerings. I offer private coaching, as well as courses, workshops, and retreats, so be sure to stay in touch if you'd like to go deeper together. Thank you, loves. Have a gorgeous day. Ciao.